Here on the Middle Sized Garden YouTube channel, we interview lots of experts such as professional gardeners and garden designers. So I've pulled together some of their tips and how they're gardening and doing some of the most common jobs in the garden today because things change. Some of the traditional gardening advice still works and some has been superseded by new research or ways of doing things easier. I'll put links to the videos where I interviewed them and which has more information if you're interested in the description below along with any other resources I mention. And if you're new here, the Middle Size Garden uploads weekly with tips, ideas and inspiration for your garden. So if you'd like to see the videos when you open up YouTube, tap the subscribe button, they're free. And if you'd like YouTube to notify you when a new video is uploaded, tap the notifications bell. At the beginning of the gardening year, as winter draws to an end, perhaps we think about sowing seeds first. But there are a couple of jobs that sometimes get left to later, which should be done earlier. And the number one of these jobs is tackling slugs and snails. We'll go over to Tom Brown, head gardener at West Dean Gardens in Sussex and gardening writer, and he'll explain why it's so important to make sure you tackle slugs and snails the minute the new shoots start to come up through the ground in spring. Slugs and snails are, can be problematic, but if you can get to them early, for example, February time in this country when they start to emerge, if you can control them then, you'll find that they don't reproduce themselves throughout the year. So if you've got two slugs in February, that soon becomes 50 slugs and that soon becomes 500 slugs. So if you can get on those two slugs early on, you stop that cycle. So things like upturned grapefruit skins, beer traps, in your borders early on, try and control things and be more persistent than they are. And so you put the upturned grapefruit skins and the beer traps and then you go and fish them out and um, throw them away. Do you use also organic slug pellets at that time at all? You can, and if people use um, organic slug pellets that are sort of pet and, and child friendly, don't feel that you've got to mulch the border with slug pellets. Um, three or four slug pellets per square metre and the way I've sort of used them in the past is to put a, a stone and a, a roofing tile and then put a few pellets underneath the roofing tile. So the slugs will then ha um, find refuge there during the day and you've got a few pellets there which will deal with it rather than creating a, a blue mulch. And, and people can make the, d the choices, but there are organic pet friendly ones available now. Weeding is another job that can't be left until later in the year. Well-known YouTuber Charles Dowding says that you really ought to weed the weeds almost before they appear. I did a number of interviews with professional gardeners of all kinds on weeding and I'll put that video in the description below. But the conclusion I came to after talking to so many people about it was that there's just no substitute for good old-fashioned hand weeding. Using a hoe in flower borders is quite difficult because there's the problem of damaging the plants around. And the same goes for using sprays, either chemical sprays from brands or your own homemade sprays from something like vinegar. It does leave deposits in the ground and it can damage plants around. And also it's not permanent. That is the real thing to remember about weeds, is it doesn't matter if you pave your garden or you cover it with artificial turf or whatever, you will still get weed seeds blowing in on the wind or brought in by birds. And they can settle almost anywhere. So if you start weeding early and you weed regularly, that's probably the best way of keeping weeding to a minimum because it'll never get out of hand. And I really wish that I took my own advice on this one because I'm always leaving it too late. There is some research to show that no dig, no till actually reduces weeds. And that's because when you turn over soil, you actually release buried weed seeds into the light and you activate them. And also, no dig, no till involves quite a lot of mulch, which can also deprive weed seeds of light. There's a video on no dig for flower borders, which I did with the no dig, no till guru, Charles Dowding, and I'll put that in the description below. But the basic principle is that you only dig if you're creating a hole to put a plant in or to take one out. You don't turn the soil at all. And you also add a layer of mulch once a year and you don't dig that in, you let the worms and the microorganisms in the soil slowly work it in for you. And this feeds them and it also improves the soil structure. But whether you do no dig, no till or not, 
every single professional and expert that I've interviewed has always mulched their garden. This is a piece of traditional advice that really has lasted and stood the test of time. There are huge variations in exactly how much you mulch. I've interviewed people who've added as much as two feet of mulch onto their herbaceous border. And I've also interviewed head gardener and author of The Jungle Garden, Philip Oostenbrink, who has a foliage-based jungle garden in his own back garden in Kent. And he only mulches once every two years with a two to three inch layer of mulch. So what do you use for mulch? People can use garden compost, well-rotted manure. There's a brand called Strouch, which is based on straw. People use wood chips or bark chippings, and they can also use leaf mould. And many people mix these, and it's whatever is most convenient for you to use at any particular time. Looking at all the different ways people have mulched, I also think that if you want very high performance, either from your flowers or your vegetables, then that's when you'll be using the thicker layers of mulch. But if you've got a largely foliage-based garden, like Philip Oostenbrink's Jungle Garden, where there are relatively few flowers, then perhaps that's why he's able to get away with mulching a bit less than somebody who's got a really thick flower border. So, as spring continues, it's time to think about what flowers you're going to have in your garden over spring, summer and autumn. And it may seem bizarre to think that sometimes flowers and gardens actually aren't considered as going together. But there has been a change over the last few years in how many flowers people want in their gardens. Over to Tomoko Kawauchi, Design Director of Charlotte Row Garden Design, to talk a bit about this. Um, I think people are more into colours now and they're more into floral things. It comes from sort of interior design fashion a few years ago, then moved on to garden design. Um, I think we get more inquiries about people wanting to have flowers with a strong colour. They're not scared to mix a blue, orange, pink sometimes. Before we had a few period of a People just want a minimal garden with an evergreen, just a green on its own, but it's getting more exciting. The other thing, of course, is that flowers are very good for pollinators, and a lot of people want to support bees in their garden. And flowers, of course, come from annuals, perennials, shrubs, trees, and bulbs. As spring goes on, it's the annuals and perennials we're probably thinking of planting. And when it comes to annuals, you can either grow them from seed, buy them as plug plants, or buy them as bedding plants from your local garden centre. The advantages of growing from seed is that it's cheaper and you can often get colours and varieties that you can't get in your local stores. And also, it deals with the issue of long supply chains. There are a number of reasons why people are getting increasingly concerned about lorries full of plants travelling across continents and maybe bringing viruses and bugs with them. So as spring moves along, you start to think about growing your own seeds. And one of the things that more than one expert has told me is that unless you've got a heated greenhouse, a heated propagator or grow lights, it's better to plant seeds slightly later in the season than earlier. You may want to get ahead, but if you've got a packet of seeds that says plant between February and April, you're probably better off to start round about in the middle of that period rather than at the beginning. It's because the days get longer and warmer and lighter and the seeds often respond much better. And now we'll go over to Sue Oriel of Country Lane Flowers for more advice on sowing seeds. Sue and her partner Stephanie Bates grow all the flowers for their flower business in their own gardens and much of this is from seed. Now because uh, as a grower we don't want to waste seeds, um, you know, it, it is all part of making our business work, is not to overuse seeds. Fifteen plants will do me very nicely for the season, so I'll just pop these into the top like this, one by one by one. Um, this is possibly not the most fascinating thing to watch, but it shows you just how easy it is to manoeuvre a single seed if you need to. And there they go, they look like little babies in there. Um, usually the planting depth of a seed is about the same size as the seed. Things very rarely need a lot of depth. So that's them in there. And then in order to cover them, 
I will just, it often says sprinkle over, but you don't need to sprinkle over. You've got plenty of compost there. Just muddle them in like that so that they're under. And, and then just give them a little shake down. Then the next thing to do is always put a label on. You think you will remember, but you won't. Um, and then water the seed tray from the bottom like that so that the, the moisture is brought up through the soil. And I'll leave that in there for about 10 minutes and then I'll notice it's looking damp on the top. I will take that out and pop it into a propagator. But annuals, of course, are not the only flowers in the garden. Annuals, by the way, are flowers that grow, flower and die in one year and you then clear them away and you grow them again from seed or buy them again the following year. But perennials are plants that live in your garden for three years or more. Sometimes they go dormant in the winter and you won't see any part of the plant, they'll sort of disappear under the earth and sometimes they'll stay above ground for the whole time. But head gardener Tom Brown says that he reckons that a good herbaceous border should probably have only about 20% annuals and about 80% should be perennials or shrubs. Spring and autumn are the two best times to plant perennials. You can plant them in summer, but if you plant any kind of plant into a really hot, dry period of weather, it will struggle to survive and you'll have to do much more watering. So if you can get all your plants planted in spring or in the autumn, that is better. And with so much choice, how do you start thinking about how to plan your herbaceous border? Stephen Edney of the No Name Nursery has some advice here. So if you're going to make a purchase, think about when is the time you sit in your garden most frequently. I love Daphne Pelua. It's, it's a, a wonderful evergreen scented shrub but it flowers in February. In the summer it's dead boring. Now if you're not going to pass that shrub during the winter and it's right down the bottom of the garden you're never going to enjoy it because perhaps you don't ever go in your garden in the winter. So think about how you use your garden when you go in your garden and then think about okay so I spend most of my time in June and July in my garden because I go on holiday in August and I'm just not around very much or I'm really busy with the kids it's summer holidays and so we don't spend much time in the garden we're out off on day trips so just think really carefully about when you want that plant to come into flower and then when you speak to your um, your, your plant specialist whether that be at a garden or a, or a nursery or a, a plant fair or a garden center um, Ask him when does that plant reach its flowering potential um, and, uh, and then just make sure you design your garden around with your own wants and needs. That's a really important thing. When it comes to planting perennials in a border and getting a really good effect, I would take advice from Rosie Hardy of Rosie Hardy's Cottage Garden Plants any day. Rosie also has a very good YouTube channel. It's called Rosie Hardy Gardening and it looks at growing specific plants and gardening techniques, so do go over and check it out. And here is Rosie explaining how she plans a border and puts it together. With broad leaves like this of the hosta, this one is a beautiful one, this one is called Purple Heart. Now Purple Heart has got these beautiful purple markings down the stem and into the heart of the leaf. That then picks up with the big leaf behind of the regersia and this bronze colouring but they're two completely different shaped large leaves and they look really good together. You then have frothiness of this blue here of the phlox moving into using the light green, the colour of the stem of the hosta there, the colour of the stem of the angelica and then a big round ball at the top. So all of this blends in. It's quite architectural but then there's also some soft flower in there as well to soften the edges. However, before your perennials and your annuals really get going, there is one rather dull job that you really have to do sooner rather than later, and that's staking. If you leave staking to midsummer, your plants will flop over the lawn, flop over the paths, flop over each other, and it's awfully difficult to bring them back into a nice shape. By midsummer, your border will have filled out and it's full of flowers. And there is one technique that you can use to keep it going as long as possible. Paul and Francis Moskowitz have got a fantastic herbaceous border and they open their garden for the National Garden Scheme in England at least once a year. 
and so Frances will let you in on her secret weapon. Well, to, to make the border carry on through the summer and into the autumn, this is, these are the most useful things to have in your hand when you're wandering around the garden. Um, every time you go in the garden, I have a pair just about everywhere on a table by the house, several pairs in the greenhouses, and um, it, it, these ensure that you have continuous flowering, basically. Um, and if I see something like a cosmos or a zinnia uh, that needs just to have its little flower off, then I'll just snip them off. Now, I try and snip down, cut the, the flowering head off down to the next joint. But sometimes if I'm leaning into the border, I can't quite make that. The most important thing is to snip the flower off to make sure the energy is going back down into the plant rather than into the seeds. So what about the lawn? Professional gardeners I've spoken to, particularly those in very temperate climates like the south of England, say that they keep mowing their lawn all year round. They don't follow the traditional advice to put the lawn mower away in late autumn and bring it out in spring. But this is very much about temperatures. If your winter temperatures are regularly 5 degrees Celsius, 40-ish Fahrenheit during the day and with relatively few frosts, then your lawn and indeed your weeds will keep on growing. And so you'll need to keep on mowing. But of course, we mow much less often and with our blades on a higher setting. There's a certain amount of debate as to whether a lawn is a very sustainable part of the garden. And once again, this is very much depends on your individual approach to a lawn. Lawns are good carbon sinks and underneath the grass there is a wonderful infrastructure of soil microorganisms and worms, so they are valuable. But if you use lots of weed killers and chemicals on them and you mow them regularly with a petrol mower, then the pressure of all that can mean that they are not part of sustainable gardening. But there is a compromise which was suggested to us by Jane Moore, author of Gardening for Wildlife and Gardening for Butterflies. And she suggests that you mow your lawn less often, say once every two weeks, and you mow it on a slightly higher setting so that some of the daisies and buttercups that offer uh, pollen for pollinators are allowed to flower briefly and then be chopped down. And actually, we have really enjoyed doing this with our lawn over the past year. I would say that it is not perfect. You will not get a perfect lawn. And a lawn with stripes and neat edges can set off a border beautifully. So this is very much a question of your own personal taste. We found that having a pollinator-friendly lawn, which we don't fertilise, we don't water, and we don't use weed killer on, and which we mow less often, is for us an ideal compromise about getting the best out of a lawn without actually using up too many resources. And of course, it saves us time and effort as well. As you go through the gardening year, we're always planning for the seasons and years ahead. And one of the difficult things about gardening is that sometimes you don't get a very instant effect. If you paint a wall in your house, you can see immediately what it's going to be like and whether it's going to work. But with gardening, you're planting something that actually is only going to look good in six months or even a year's time. And I think the biggest issue around here is with bulbs, because you plant bulbs in the autumn and you won't see what they're going to look like until the spring. So I asked garden designer Pollyanna Wilkinson how she plans her bulbs. So Polly, what are your tips for buying spring bulbs for next year? So we need to think about our months. So January, that's for snowdrops. February, that's Iris reticulata and crocuses. Then March, we've got narcissus, so daffodils. April, you've got your early tulips. And May, you've got your late tulips and then also alliums. So if you think about it in the different months, you're going to have a succession of colour from January through to May. I put together a gardening jobs playlist, which is at the end of this video. And of course, there are several important gardening jobs we haven't mentioned, like pruning and dividing perennials. But I think that with the gardening jobs we've mentioned, you should have a beautiful garden and be ready to go on to the other jobs, which we will cover over the next few months. So let me know if you agree or disagree or feel I've left something absolutely critical out. And thank you for watching. Goodbye.